through conversations and things, I've come to sort of believe that many of you who are, at least some of you who, who were here at the conference this week, um, think that possibly there was difference of, differences of opinion with regard to marriage and the role of the woman and the role of man, or that there was some sort of disunity. Uh, I'm not aware of any disunity that I had with any of the things that were said here. Uh, I'm not aware of any disunity theologically regarding marriage, manhood, and womanhood that I have with anyone that spoke here. Um, let me just share with you something. When you've been in the ministry for a long time and you touch the theme of marriage, it is always very, very frightening because you can't say everything at the same time, number one. And number two, people seem to take certain things and run with them conformed to what they want to hear. We as ministers always find ourselves when we're teaching on marriage, not just teaching on marriage, but also for every principle taught, it seems like we're giving 10 corrections or 10 uh, don't misunderstand me here. For example, there is a dire need in the world today for, for husbands to lead their families in a Christ-like manner. My wife, uh, I've heard her say several times, even to young groups of men, that if a, uh, a man-eating lion got out in the world, it'd starve to death because there aren't any men to eat. Um, but then you hear that, and, and some young men who truly love the Lord and they want to obey, come back a year later after hearing what you taught on manhood, and you're, you're literally terrified by how they interpreted you. And, and they're, they're being demanding to their spouses. They're, they're doing all sorts of things that aren't Christ-like. And it's like, no, I didn't mean any of that. So, so there were times when I think I probably said something quite strong. And a brother felt the need to say something like, you know, don't misunderstand him. And then there were other times when others did the same thing. And I came back and said, very, very careful. You have to understand that I'm a little, well, we say in the United States, gun-shy. Because I have seen a movement that seemed to be healthy of men seeking to truly be leaders. And then it just go to several terrible extremes. Let, let me share with you something about, about Ephesians 5 and about Proverbs 31. These things that are written there are absolutely impossible for carnal people. I was asked to teach in Samara, Russia several years ago on marriage. And I think it ended up being something like, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around 20 messages. And I was already into the teens. I mean, I was already more than halfway through. And one Russian brother came up to me and said, Brother Paul, the teaching's been wonderful, but you haven't talked about marriage. This is a conference on marriage, and you haven't talked about marriage. And I said, what have I talked about? He said, the fruit of the Spirit. I said, I can take a man who knows all the principles about leadership and, and submission and all these things, and yet he's not filled with the Spirit, and his marriage will be a disaster. He's not bearing the fruit of the Spirit. His marriage will be a disaster. But I can take a man who knows almost nothing about marriage, but is truly truly filled with the Spirit and bearing the fruit of the Spirit, he'll do okay. He'll do fine. But the fact of the matter is, we don't need to grab a hold of one and let go of the other. We need to grab a hold of both of them. We need to know the biblical principles, but the biblical principles will be misunderstood by carnal people, and they will be taken to extremes according to the desire of those carnal people. You see... It's very, very important to understand. That's why I, I love to teach on marriage. And because what you need to understand is this. If you become a godly man, a truly godly Christ-like man, your wife will be blessed. And if you become a truly godly Christ-like woman, your husband will be blessed even though 
you could never give a, a series of lectures on marriage. And, and what I want you to do, and what I'm going to talk about tonight, is if someone just thinks, I want to become a better husband, or I want to become a better wife, well, that's not really the way the Bible approaches it. The Bible approaches it this way. I want to be more conformed to the image of Christ in everything in my life. That's why a lot of times I'm, I'm kind of shy and taken back when someone wants some specific answers for a specific area. Because I have found that godly people, Christ-like people, spirit-filled people will do all right in every situation. And that's, that's what we want. That's what we desire. You know, my prayer it, almost every night is, Lord, give my, give my wife a, a better husband. And that means make me more like Christ. Another thing I want you to realize is that so many immature believers focus upon what their spouse is not doing and they do not focus much on what they are not being. You see, it doesn't say husbands command your wife to submit to you. That's a thing between the Lord and the woman. And woman, it doesn't say that you're supposed to nag your husband constantly to love you. But God tells your husband to love you. And that tells us that both of us created in the image of God. We have a relationship with God. A relationship. And we have specific commands. And we are accountable to God to carry out those commands. Now, I want us to go to Romans chapter 12. I want to, to talk about how to grow how to be motivated in the Christian life, how to grow in love for God. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, I want you to look here. First of all, Paul is urging his readers to do something. You see, a lot of times when, when people preach, I find that they seem like they're just giving information. But you know, when a building's on fire, you must give information to people. That information is the building is on fire. But... It's always going to be followed with a, an appropriate exhortation. Run for your life. It's the same way in this truth that we're dealing with. You know, you can sit here and take in truth all week. But the fact of the matter is, the purpose is not merely to inform, but to transform. That you be changed. That you actually live differently. Do you see that? And it is a matter of life and death. I have not yet found a theologian who can explain to me how I am going to enter into heaven fully accepted in the beloved. That is true, true, true. Yet at the same time, know that I'm going to stand before God and I am going to be judged. Now, both of those are true and the scriptures really don't tell us how that's going to be put together. I have the assurance of heaven because my hope is in Christ and Christ alone. I will stand before Christ and I will be judged with regard to what I have done in the body, both good and and evil. I will be held accountable for ministry. There is a sense in which one of the gifts God's given me is that it seems like every day I just see eternity. I know I must live in light of eternity. We are not talking here about your best life now. We're talking about life, death, heaven, hell, eternity. And so when Paul is going to teach them something, he isn't just going to lay the information out there. And say, I hope you like it. He's going to teach it and then say, listen to me. He's going to urge you. You've got to hearken. You've got to obey. You've got to take this seriously. I have a missionary one time. He was preaching in Africa. And it was kind of a, 
a camp meeting sort of thing, and there was a young man on the front row, and he got to his first point. He finished his first point in application with regard to a godly life, and the young man got up and ran out of the tent. thought that was unusual. The next night, he gets up and he starts preaching again. And he's preaching. He gets to his first point, first application. A young man got up and ran out of the tent. He did it the third night. And finally, the missionary stopped him and said, What are you doing? And he said, Well, I just figured I've just learned something that I'm not doing. I need to go do it before I learn something else. Now, maybe his zeal was a bit awkward, but I appreciate it. Unlike so many people that will soak in, soak in, soak in, but don't realize this is not about soaking. This is about transformation. It's about being a godly man, a godly woman, a godly young person. Paul says, I urge you, I plead with you. The old preachers preaching like a dying man to dying men. Life is like this. Yesterday, you were born... You were educated. You now work, you'll retire, you'll die. It's a moment in time. And there's no replay. There's no let's do it again. There's no reincarnation. This is serious. This is serious. So he says, I urge you to do something. To do what? To present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Now, you know, in, in some evangelical traditions, you'll find them giving an invitation every service and people going forward and rededicating and rededicating and rededicating their life. And many times this text is used, but that's that's not what this text means. As a matter of fact, this is an aorist tense command. It's once and for all. Now, there is a sense in which daily we need to to reapply truth. We need to recommit ourselves daily. But here, Paul is talking about something different. This is kind of this prophetic, how long will you limp between two opinions? If God is Lord, make a decision today that will affect the rest of your life. He says, I'm urging you once and for all, stop limping between two opinions. Stop having one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. Stop living for self and living for God. Make a decision. Yes, Calvinistic preachers call for decisions. Make a decision. Choose you this day. Choose you this day. You don't hear this much in evangelical preaching anymore. Because Bunyan's vanity fair is no longer outside the church. It's in the church. But I'm calling you to something biblical. Choose you this day how you're going to live the rest of your life. Now, he says, present your bodies. He is calling upon believers to give up their lives. To give up their lives. Now, it's interesting that he uses the word body. And I think it's extremely important. I have had to deal with people who called themselves Christians who were involved in drunkenness and adultery and all sorts of things. And when I get down and finally press their buttons, you know what they usually say to me? Don't judge me. You don't know, you don't know my heart. And I always tell them the same thing. I don't have to know your heart. I just need to see what you do with your body. And what you do with your body will tell me exactly what's going on in your heart. Don't think that there's some sort of strange dualism or dichotomy or something within you. Don't think that you can somehow separate part of you from another part of you. You are what you are before God. And don't use this excuse that your heart is devoted while the rest of you is not. That's simply not true. What you need to understand about heart is that the heart functions as something of, in the scriptures, it would, it's like the control center of everything you are. It controls your, well, everything, your will, your emotions, your actions, everything. Let me give you an example. Let's say that um, this building was on fire and you knew it was on fire. 
It would affect every aspect of your being. Emotionally, you would become afraid. With the will, you would make certain decisions and your body would follow those decisions. So don't trick yourself. What you see in the mirror is what you see in your heart. Don't talk about a love for Christ that's not proven. Don't talk about a devotion to Christ where there is no evidence for said devotion. Saying for once in your life, make a decision. What kind of decision is it? There's no greater thing than a, that a man, woman, or young person can give but their life. You only have one. It's fleeting. It's small. It's quick. And you're commanded by God to give it all to Him. To Him. My sister was talking to me a few months ago and she says, well, how's it going with all the kids? I said, fine, I'm just continue teaching them, praying for them. I said, I just want them to to try to follow in the footsteps of their father. She said, you want them all to be preachers? I said, no. But I want them to strive to do what I have in a very stumbling way attempted to do. Live their life for the glory of God. Whether they be a school teacher or a military man or a doctor or a lawyer or a carpenter, a ditch digger, a nurse, that every breath, every beat of the heart be for the glory of God. For that very thing you were made and for that very reason you find a lack of peace and much misery in your own heart to the degree that you do the thing for which you were made, you will find peace and joy in life. To the degree you stray from that, you'll find nothing. 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 Now, he says, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. This word living here can, can be, Paul could have two things in mind, and it's hard to discern which of the two or possibly both together. One has to do with if you are going to accomplish this, if you're going to offer yourself to God, there is only one way, and that is to be alive. When we talk about being alive, we're talking about being regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the true meaning of being born again. You see, in the United States and possibly here, we have a thing called born againism, where being born again simply means that you raised your hand and made a decision at some evangelistic campaign. That's not being born again. Being born again is a sovereign, supernatural work of the Spirit of God. It comes upon a man through the preaching of the gospel. And that supernatural work of the Spirit in conversion, I believe, is actually a greater work of God than when he created the universe ex nihilo. Because when he created the universe ex nihilo, out of nothing, that was one thing. But to take a mass of corrupt humanity and make it into a child of God, now there is a work of power. So we're not talking about moralism here. We're not talking about turning over new leaf. What we're talking about is preaching the gospel to individuals who are genuinely, truly, biblically converted and being new creatures begin to live a new way. You see that? But it can also refer to zeal, passion, it's amazing. You go to a, a football game, whether it's American football or football here in Europe, and see people literally almost, almost tearing their own flesh. To see them going almost wild 
any extent to see their team win, any extent to get tickets, any extent to buy the right jersey. Talk, 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 talk. That's all anyone talks about. In light of the Son of God suffering the wrath of God on Calvary and dying for us, what is that? What is football? What is anything? Nonsense. And worse than nonsense. I'll never forget years ago when I was pastoring in Peru and it was the World Cup. And everything shuts down, literally. And people would stand on the street in front of television stores that would have TVs in the window just so they could see the game. I mean, everything shuts down. And I remember there was this little woman in my church from the mountains. She was about this tall. <laughs> and it was a Sunday night. And uh, I was coming down the steps of this old building we used as a church. And she was going up, up the steps to the roof. And I said, Delia, I said, uh, I'm, I'm going to shut down the, the building. And she says, oh, I know, I know. In Spanish, of course. She said, I know. I said, where are you going? She says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the roof to pray. And I said, well, I'm, but I'm closing the door. She said, I know. It'll be all right. So while everyone is going crazy for the World Cup, that so broke her heart, she stayed up on the roof of the church for an entire week, only coming down to refill her bottle of water, to fast and to pray that God's people, that their heart would be turned towards him in a greater way. Do you see? Living for what really matters. Living for what's real. A living sacrifice. A holy sacrifice. Do you know that holy really... You know, I ask people... What does holiness mean? They say, well, God is sinless. I go, what does righteousness mean? Well, God is sinless. I said, well, there's a problem. Holiness, the root idea is to cut. Like, let's say I had a wooden cutting board here and I had a carrot and I started, my wife can chop it really, really fast. And then when she loads up this end, she moves it over and she creates a pile. She separates, separates, cuts and separates. That's the idea. When the Bible says that God is holy, it does mean he's, he's sinless, but only in an indirect way. Holiness means that God is separate. That's what Jesus is getting to in the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name, separate be thy name. And what it means is this, that God exists in a completely different category. He is not quantitatively, he's not just quantitatively bigger than us. I want you to understand this. He's not like us, just bigger and better. He is qualitatively different from us. He is in a completely different category. And when you see God is holy, it means that you have placed God in your heart in a category totally separate and distinct from all other categories. You'll hear people say, say this, keep God number one. My question is, well, what's number two? You see, what you need to understand, God is number one, number two, number three, number four, all the way down. For you to see God as holy is for you to see him as in a category all to himself above all other categories. Completely separate, completely distinct, completely other. And for you to be holy is not just that you follow the rule book. For you to be holy is for you to be separate unto him. When Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. A good free translation would be, blessed are those who's in, who's in, their, in their heart, there are no competing loyalties. They are, they're unalloyed. They are separate unto God. Belong to God. 
belong to God. When I first told my, my pastor years ago that I, I said, God is calling me to preach. I've never met a man like him since. He was an, a rare and amazing man, giant of a man, kind of really intimidating. I went in his office and I said, I believe God has called me to preach. He looked up and he said, boy, can you be alone? And I thought he meant this. I thought he meant, you know, if I preach the truth, no one will like me and I'll be alone. Well, that has happened. But that's not what he meant. He said, well, all the other boys are running around in their bachelor packs. And all the other ministers or young ministers are getting together and singing Kumbaya. Can you be alone with God in prayer, in the scriptures, in the night watch? Can you be separate unto God? You belong to him. You belong to him. No other. No other. To him. To him. And in being that way, if you are separate unto him, you will be separated from that which he hates. Do you know when you read through the scripture, you discover quite quickly there are things that God loves. You discover quite quickly that there are things that God hates in a terrifying fashion. Yes, things he hates. You very rarely hear a prosperity preacher talk about the doctrine of the hatred of God, but it's all over the Bible. He hates unrighteousness, and he names some of them specifically. He hates them. Even a proud look he hates. So one of the things we do, because we love him, because we want to please him, is we go into scripture and we discover what God hates, and we learn to hate what he hates, and we learn to love what he loves. Living, holy, sacrifice, acceptable to God. That which is pleasing to God. Paul said whether he lived or died in 2 Corinthians 5, he had one goal. Be pleasing to the Lord. Man, if, if I could just get that one thing. If that could just be 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, the true controlling principle of my life... How much more holy would I be if I could just set that one thing in place like stone? I have only one true desire to be pleasing to the Lord. And then I went into scripture to find out what that means. Everything else would fall in place, wouldn't it? Now. Paul is asking us, urging us, pleading with us. To give away our lives. And he goes on and he says. That is your spiritual service of worship. That word spiritual can also mean rational. Let me share with you something. It is not rational. To give your life away. To any man. Any religious man. That's what we call a cult. It is not rational. To give yourself lock, stock, and barrel to a spiritual leader or even a church. That is not rational. That is dangerous. If you have a church, it's a biblical church seeking to do the will of God. Praise God. Be faithful to that church. But you never give your life away to anyone less than God. My wife and, have, and I have many conversations about what we should do in our family and our home. Not because she doesn't follow my leadership. I need her to ask questions. Why? I need her to give input. Why? I am not Jesus Christ. I am a fallible man. That's why ministers only have a authority to the degree that they correctly expound the scriptures. This silly idea in these charismatic prosperity churches about, you know, touch not God's anointed and the man of God and all that. 
That is a great twisting of Scripture that serves to stick money in the minister's pocket and control people. That's all that is. Our authority comes from the Scriptures. Do you see that? And it is not rational to give your life away to the best men. It is not rational to give your life away. To devote yourself wholly and completely to anything other than Christ. But it is rational to give your life away to Christ. The Son of God who became a man. Who died and rose again. You know, I always like bringing this point up. You know, he was tempted in all ways like us. Yet he didn't sin. You think, man, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. But see, you're not really understanding what he's saying there. You're not understanding. Let let, let me give you an example. Let's say, I'm, I can't do this, but let's say that I could. Let's say that I was a, a power, uh, an Olympic lifter, okay? And um, you had a bar and two plates. It's 135 pounds. So I do a clean and jerk, and I get it up, and I get it over my head. And all of you applaud. <laughs> Wonderful. So we stick two more plates on. Now we got 225 pounds. And I go down again, good form, pick it up, get it over my head, and you applaud. And then we put on three plates. We got 315 on there, and I get it up to here, get it over my head, start to shake, my elbows give, and I have to throw it off my back. Okay? Now, let's make this a competition. You and me are like the the weightlifter that takes the 135, gets it up, gets it over. And then there's a professional weightlifter over here who takes the same bar, gets it up, gets it over. Then we get the 225, pick it up, get it up, get it over. We're happy. He takes it, gets it up, boom. Then we get to the 315 and we go up and we can't do it. But this guy over here takes the 315, picks it up and gets it over his head. Then he goes to 405, picks it up, gets it over his head. Then he goes to 600, gets it up, and picks it over his head. Then he takes the building, picks it up, and gets it over his head. (laughs) He didn't just do what you did without failing. He did infinitely more than you ever picked up and didn't fail. You see the difference? It isn't just that Christ was tempted like you. He was temptedly infinitely more than you, and still he didn't fall. Let me prove my point. The Bible says that the end of all commands is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, I want to share with you something. Since Adam till now, the possibly what? Maybe a hundred billion people or whatever that have lived on this planet. Not one person among all those billions of people has loved the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, not even for a fraction of a second. Do you understand me? No one has ever done that among billions and billions of people of Adam's race. No one has ever loved the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, even for a fraction of a second. What all humanity could not do for a fraction of a second, the Lord Jesus Christ did every moment of his life. Now, it makes sense to give your life away to someone like that. For him. For him. I talked about that message I preached several years ago that became well known. It's, it's a hard thing to be famous for only one sermon. <laughs> but I guess one's better than zero. And I talked about if my son ever came to me and said, Dad, I'm going into that country. And I tell him, 
Son, you cross the border into that country. They'll kill you the moment you say the word Jesus. But dad, I'm going. My response would be, son, I'll carry your backpack to the border. And I'll praise God as they take your life. I'm not kidding. I wasn't kidding then. I'm not kidding now. That is not a foolish thing. It is not a foolish thing. As Elliot said, for a man to give up what he cannot keep, to gain that which he cannot lose. Now, please, God is not speaking through me at this moment, telling somebody to go do that somewhere. I'm trying to prove a point. It is rational to give ourselves entirely to him. And let me share with you something. He is trustworthy. And not just in big things, in little things, in everything. He is trustworthy. You can trust your entire life to him. He faileth not. He faileth not. I've never met one spiritual saint, even those who have suffered to the greatest degree, that went to their grave with a complaint on their lips. He does not fail. So it is rational. To give yourself to him. Now, you know, let me say this. I, I'm kind of that guy who God gave him a horse and a message and he killed the horse. I'm tired. I'm not the same person I was. I'll never be. It seems like every day I just get weaker. My only regret is that I didn't give him more. That's my only regret. And oh, there's a bunch of them. My only regret is that when I did do what I did, that I didn't do it with greater and more biblical wisdom. But I have no regret for anything I gave. I only have regrets for what I kept. It is a rational service of worship. Now, here's the main point, though, that I want to get to. He is urging us to give away. You you could say the only possession that we have to give away our lives for him. Now, before I get into this, I want to say giving away your life doesn't mean you become a missionary or a pastor or a street preacher It means within his providence for your life, you devote yourself to him. Whether it be a school teacher or a nurse, a mother at home, a carpenter, a janitor, a doctor. That you don't fool yourself by singing about your devotion without practicing your devotion. That you honestly, and not just once, But many times throughout the course of your life, you look in the mirror of God's word and you ask yourself, Lord, am I on course? Are there competing loyalties in my heart? Are there things that are keeping me from you, from greater service? What do you want of me? You see, the janitor that is wholeheartedly devoted to Christ will have a better day on the day of judgment than the missionary who started 400 churches that was half-hearted in his duties. All our ideas, and much of it comes from all these, a lot of large preaching conferences. You think the sign that someone is a man of God is that everybody sees him on the platform. That's simply not true. I know brothers and you'll never know their name and I'm not worthy to carry their sandals. It's about here. It's about being devoted in the context of the providence of God for your life. Now, having said that, Paul is urging us, and and again, uh, Preaching is a great sorrow because you can't communicate even what you want to communicate. You know what you want to communicate isn't half the story of what God's saying. Not even a tenth part. He's saying a radical obedience to Jesus Christ. 
which finds itself not in some, some crazy extreme religious practice, but in bearing the fruit of the Spirit and walking in simple devotion to Christ and, and loving everyone around you and serving. But now, having asked us to do this, to give ourselves away, my question is, what's the motivation? How can, I mean, what could be big enough to motivate a person to give away the only life they have? What could be big enough to do that? He tells us, verse 1, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. What is the great motivation for giving our lives away? He says it here, the mercies of God. And if you can begin a journey of searching these out, you will see how it will transform your life. First of all, notice that he says, he doesn't say mercy of God. He says mercies of God. In Hebrew, if you see a body of water, like a, maybe a small pond or a small puddle of water, you use the singular. When you're looking at the ocean, you use the plural. It can mean great. It talks about greatness, the expanse of something, the largeness of something, the largeness of God's mercies. But the idea also is this. Mercies meaning the, the many faceted mercies of God. God's mercy, like God's love, is like a diamond that you hold up to the light. And there's all these facets and different brilliances that shine forth. If you want to grow in your devotion so that you can honestly give more and more of your life away, the journey to that begins by discovering more and more of the mercies of God. Now, Notice the preposition, the conjunction, the preposition, therefore. It's very important. Because when he says, I want you to give your life away, and the motivation for doing it is the mercies of God, then you go, well, what are the mercies of God? He's laid that out in the last 11 chapters. Everything that God has done for you and me in the person of Jesus Christ. That is what I'm getting to. You got the first three chapters of the book of Romans, and what do you see? A radically depraved mankind. Sinful, not strong enough. Evil. Worthy of only one thing, the wrath of a good God. And in the end, you come to these conclusions of condemnation and there's no salvation through works. Nothing we can do to refine ourselves, restore ourselves. Nothing. It is absolutely hopeless. And then we come to the end of three and going on into four and five. And what do we find? God has done a tremendous work through the death and resurrection of his only begotten son on our behalf. Now, just quickly, I want to just look back for a moment to Romans 3 because I want to point something out that I always, I'm terrible at this. I always want to preach a thousand things. But in verse 25 of chapter 3, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith, this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I believe that I have just read to you the most important passage in the entire Bible. And I'll tell you why. Notice what he says. The word propitiation. That Christ was offered as a propitiation. That is a sacrifice. A sacrifice that a appeases the wrath of God by satisfying the righteous demands of a holy God. Now, why is that important? This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Christ died on the cross to prove that God is righteous. Now, why would we need proof that God's righteous? Was there reason for doubt? Yes. What's that reason for doubt? All of the Old Testament history. When someone looks at Old Testament history with a keen eye, 
it will begin to make you wonder, is God really just? Now, why is that? Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Now, what does that mean? We don't know as much about Satan sometimes as we think we do. He is a personal being. He has fallen. He's malignant. He's evil. He was created good. He fell. And when he fell, he was brought into perfect justice. Perfect justice. God creates a world. There's Adam and Eve. The day you eat of that tree, you will die. It seems to be an open and shut case. You disobey. You're dead. There's no hope. It's over. They fall. And in Genesis 3.15, we have the proto evangelicum, which is the first promise of the gospel, that God would send someone who would be born of woman, that would take it on the heel, that would be wounded, but would crush the serpent's head and put an end to his work. Can you imagine when Satan heard that? The accuser is not just the accuser of the brethren. He's the accuser of God. Where, where's your justice? You said the day they eat of it, they die. Now there's hope. Why hope? They violated your law. They deserve to die. Why hope? How can you have hope? I thought you were good. And then Noah. Noah should have died. Noah should have died with the rest of them. Don't you understand that? Noah was a sinner. He proved that quite well afterwards, didn't he? Imagine Satan. You should have killed him too. Where is your justice? Abraham? Abra You're a friend of this man? He lied about his wife. He lied to Abimelech. He put her in danger. And he didn't believe you. Too much. Oh, in Israel, your people, your beloved, they worshiped me in the desert, not you. Where's your justice? They should die. From where do all these promises of salvation come? The law demands they die. Oh, and David, a man after your own heart, he's a murderer. An adulterer. And his pride led to the death of thousands. And so throughout history, accusation after accusation after accusation. God is not just. God is not just. God is not just. <coughs> and then 2,000 years ago, God calls to court. He calls together the court. Satan appear front and center. Do you want to know how I can give a promise to Adam? Do you want to know how I can save Noah, the sinner, from the flood? Do you want to know how I can call unbelieving Abraham my friend? Israel my people? Do you want to know how I can call David my son and still be just? Look to Calvary right now. Turn your face to Calvary because there my son dies for them all. The greatest problem in theology and philosophy is this. If God is good, he cannot forgive you. You need to understand that because that's the core of the gospel. Study the, the, not just the fathers, but 15th century, 16th century, 17th century. It was painted on every sermon. I almost never hear it today. The great problem of all problems is this. If God is good, he cannot forgive you. How can, as Paul says, look here. He says in Romans 3, verse 26, For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. How can God forgive wicked sinners and at the same time maintain his justice? There's only one way. God becomes a man, lives a perfect life, goes to the tree, 
takes the sin of his people upon himself and then is crushed under the full force of his wrath. And when he dies, he satisfies every demand of justice against God's people. And now God's people are free. And the devil, according to the writer of Hebrews, has no grounds for any accusation against them ever again or against God. So why should you offer your life as a living sacrifice? The gospel of Jesus Christ. And the more you understand the gospel, if you have a regenerate heart, the more you understand the gospel, the more your heart will give itself to God. I've heard people say, oh gosh, we're going to hear a gospel message. We've heard that. Let me share something with you. I've had people tell me, I've already studied the gospel. I tell you, I want to slap them. Just slap them. Like my wife says, sometimes people just need a high five in the face with a chair. (laughs) I want to slap them. Let me tell you something. I can't tell you, I wish I had written it down every time of all the works of Spurgeon that I've read, every time he apologized at the beginning of his sermon. Because he's getting ready to say, I'm going to preach the gospel and I will fail. I know nothing. And what I know, I can't explain. Listen to me. You will be a thousand eternities in heaven and you will still not have gotten your mind around the glory of God revealed in the gospel. Do you understand me? It is beyond comprehension. You will chase that truth throughout all eternity. Every day, if you were to discover a truckload of gold regarding the gospel, you would still know nothing at the end of your days. Even after I've said this, after a thousand eternities, you will not have reached the foothills of the Everest that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's chasing after. How is it that God saved me through His Son? The more you know the mercies of God revealed in their greatest revelation, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the more you will be compelled. You'll be like a prisoner. Who can do nothing else. When Paul said, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Yes, it was a literal sense. But it was far more behind those words. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians. Just turn there quickly. Chapter 5. Verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves... It is for God. And if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. The love of Christ controls us. Now, some people in their humanistic, carnal flesh say, oh, yeah, Paul's love for Christ was so great. No, that's not what Paul's saying. The genitive here, I believe, is not Paul is not boasting in his love for Christ. Paul is boasting in Christ's love for him. He's saying, haven't gotten my mind just a little bit around the love of Christ revealed on Calvary. It controls me. I remember a young man who was radically converted on a campus. And he was like kind of the man about campus. And in one day, I mean, it just like, Boom, flip-flop. He gets converted in the afternoon. The next day, someone bought him a Ryrie study Bible. He took it to class. And then a day later, he's out in the middle of the quad handing out tracts. I mean, that quick. And a horrible young man. And someone came up to him and said, What are you doing? People think you've lost your mind. And it was decades ago when people, you know, everybody said they believed in Jesus. And he said this. Did, did, do you believe he really died for us sinners? 
And the student goes, yeah, yeah, I believe. Then what else can I do? I have no place else to go. I have nothing else to do. This is the greatest thing ever. You see? People uh, came to our church. I'm not an elder there. There has to be somewhere where you wait tables. And, um, and my, my, the elders asked me to preach a series. So I was up there preaching. And someone came, several people came for like three weeks. And then they came up to the elders and they said, we have a question. And Elder Anthony said, well, what? He goes, well, has Paul compromised? And they said, and he said, Paul, when they, when they said that, he goes, I began to smile. I knew exactly what they were going to say. He said, why do you ask? He said, well, we've been here for three weeks, and, and all he's taught on is the love of God. He goes, no, you're seeing not now the YouTube Paul. You're seeing this is the regular guy here. <laughs> Because I want you to know, I honestly believe that if a truly regenerate heart, that's why regeneration is so important. That's why a converted membership is so important. If a truly regenerate heart comes to understand little by little the mercies of God and the cross of Calvary, you won't have to drive them, whip them, beat them. You'll have to, you'll have to follow them. It's the love of God revealed in Calvary. Take, take some of the great saints down through history that, that were extraordinary in their devotion and their service. How do you think they got that way? Do you think they were just of better stock than you? They're not. They came from Adam, just like you. No better stock. Were they more devoted? I mean, well, what was the deal? No, you're putting the cart before the horse. I'll tell you what the deal is. Only one thing. They saw more of the love of God in Christ than you're seeing. Because if your heart is regenerate, it will grab you and you will become a prisoner of Christ. And look, look what he says again in 2 Corinthians. He says, 14, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that the one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all. So that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. We are to live for him. Now, I want to end by talking about how do you grow in your love for God? You know, I, for years I have watched while Almost every sincere believer I know laments the fact that they do not love God as they ought. I lament the fact that I do not love God as I ought. No one loves God as they ought. The only one who's ever done that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Even the most holy of men and women do not love God as they ought. But all should be growing in their love for God. Now, how can we do that? Well, I lament the fact that so often, you know, there's all these conferences, acquire the fire, revive us again, you know, this and that. And students and adults will go to these conferences and the music and the impassioned preaching and the manipulation of emotions and all sorts of things that go on. And they're fired up. They leave the conference and it lasts about three days. And then they're back where they started. Not only that, if that happens enough, they become delusioned, critical, and angry. How do you grow? How do you make yourself grow in your love for God? Well, let me give you an illustration. Let's say that tomorrow you come to the church at about 10 o'clock to clean up and help. Okay? It's been a long week. You've decided you're going to come. And, and I've showed up. And you walk in that door right there, and I'm laying on my back here. Haven't died of a heart attack. I'm just laying on my back, okay? And as I'm laying on my back, you see that I've got my hands like this around my belt. And I'm going like this, laying on my back. And you walk over and go, Brother Paul, what are you doing? And I say, well, isn't it obvious? No, it's not obvious. What are you doing? Well, I'm trying to get up. And you go, you've never studied physics, have you? 
If you are going to get up by the pulling on the belt, then an outside force is going to have to pull on that belt. You cannot pull yourself up by your belt. Someone from the outside of you must come and exert force to lift you up. Oh. Now you think, who would be stupid enough to lay on their back and pull at their belt all their life? You. You do it all the time. Let it sink in. Every time, usually when I say that in my church, some little kid goes, Mom, I thought we weren't supposed to use the word stupid. <laughs> but who would do that? Who would do that? Who in their right mind would do that? You see, I can't get up that way. I have to have someone quite strong come and grab my belt and pick me up from the outside. It's the same with growing in the love of God. You can't wind yourself up like a clock. Because if you do, you just wind back down again. Now, before I give you the answer, let me give you an illustration. I have been married 26 years, and I love my wife now more than I did when I first married her. Why? I mean, we've both gotten older, even though she's still beautiful and perfect. We both have gotten older. So why do I love her more? Because after 26 years, there are virtues, merits, excellencies that I see in her that I did not see in her when we were first married. And those excellencies and virtues that are in her draw out my affections and lift me up. To love her. Sometimes you see a man, or this also works with a woman, you'll see a man and he seems to really, really love his wife. I mean, really. And immediately, what do you think? That's a wonderful man. Again, you could be wrong. Is he a wonderful man? Or is he just a normal man, but he has such a wonderful wife with such excellencies, such virtue? That she pulls his affections out of him. She draws them out. And you see, I want you to see it that way. Because I believe it's true. People will ask, from where comes the zeal? From where comes the passion? From where comes the love? Well, if, if you look at a saint and you see it in them, well, then I guess there's a lot to glory in in that saint. But I don't think that's the way Christianity is supposed to work. You see, if you're unregenerate, if you're not a Christian, then the more you see of a biblical vision of God, the more you'll hate him. That's true. The more the unregenerate man sees of God, the more he hates him. That's why our society, the more and more that it, it becomes defiled, any revelation of God makes them angry. Do you see that? But the regenerate heart, the heart that has been renewed by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel, the regenerate heart, the more it sees of God, and especially God as He has revealed in the cross of Calvary, because the greatest revelation of God is the cross. Because there, all the attributes of God are portrayed. It's the first time, it is the time in history when all the attributes of God are portrayed in perfect harmony. And we see that justice and love are not against one another. The more you see of God in Christ, the more your affections will be drawn out. And the more those affections will draw you to Him and drive you into His service. Okay? And that's really the object of preaching. The object of preaching. Let, let me, um, I promise, we'll close. Uh, go, go to a text that no, no one would ever think about with regard to preaching. Go to Job 28. I'm going to show you the job of a, of a real preacher. 
Now, some of you are here from maybe other churches. Some of you are here from where preaching is all about principles or, you know, all about you or your best life now or just excitement and entertainment. Well, that, that's, not, that's not preaching and that's not church. You're in a carnival, you're in a circus, but you're not in a church. A church is about the revelation of God in Christ. Now, this is not, there's no intention here of Job to talk about preaching. But what he is talking about is an ancient form of mining. And I want you to just look at the parallels. I've thought about taking this whole thing and putting it in my, putting on a big plaque in my, in my study. Surely there is a mine for silver in a place where they refine gold. There is. The old saints, Alexander McLaren and others used to say, the dust of this book is gold. There is only one place where you can find silver, where you can find gold. And it's in the scriptures. You don't need someone's opinion about God, someone's extra biblical revelation about God. You need to know God from God's word. Iron is taken from the dust and copper is smelted from the rock. Now look at, look at what this man does just to get a piece of stone. Man puts an end to darkness and to the farthest limits. He searches out the rock and gloom and deep shadow. He sinks a shaft far from habitation, forgotten by foot. They hang and swing to and fro far from men. Here is a person who for the sake of finding ore or a bit of gold... Or a shiny rock. Look what he's willing to do. Lights a lamp. Is willing to go away from other men. Is, ordered to, is, is willing to dig and dig and dig and dig. And then it says five. The earth from it comes food. And underneath it is turned up as fire. Its rocks are the source of sapphires. And its dust contains gold. He goes down and it says in verse 9, he puts his hand on the flint. He overturns the mountains at the base. He hews out channels through the rock. This is when they had only probably Bronze Age tools that don't do too well with rock. His eyes see anything precious. He dams up the streams from flowing. And what is hidden, he brings out to the light. I've meditated that on that so often with regard to preaching and with regard to the gospel. Do you know what the object of preaching is? It's for a man to, go, to get away from other men. To hide himself. To study the scriptures. And to dialogue with other godly men through commentaries. Through, through fellowship. But to live their life finding the gold of God in the person of Christ in the text and then bringing that beauty to you so that you marvel at who God is, who Christ is, and through that marveling, you're driven to devotion. That's what's supposed to be done. That's why preachers are not sp supposed to be entertainers, movers and shakers, administrators, strategists, marketers. Are these silly, charismatic, prosperity preachers who have their hand out? You notice some of you need to hear this. That in those churches, the average length of stay for a member is about three years. Because sooner or later, they find out the only one getting rich is the preacher. Get out of there. Get in a place where Christ is preached. Do you know why most people go to prosperity preachers? Because they're just like them. The prosperity preachers don't want Christ. They want money. And the people who follow them don't want Christ. They want money. And if you're there, repent and get out of there and get in a good church that preaches only Jesus. One of the reasons I'm in the church I'm in is because the elders say over and over to all kinds of people. We're only going to give you one thing here. Christ as he is revealed in the scriptures. If you want something more, you'll not be happy here. Christ. What do I long for you? I long, listen, a man, a husband who gets a proper glimpse of God in Christ is, is not going to be a dictator over his wife and family. A woman, a wife who gets a proper view of God in Christ and all the glories to come. It's not going to be a contentious woman. 
All the missionaries that died as martyrs. All the men who have lived and died ministering without anyone knowing their name. All the women who have served and have done it well. It's not because they were better than you. They saw more of Christ than you. But God has promised His Spirit belongs to all His people. To the wise and the noble. To the uneducated. To those who cannot even read. There's nothing hindering you from knowing more about God in Christ than that, than that simply you will not. Give yourself to this. Now, one practical thing I would like to say is this. Sometimes people come up to me and they go, how do I start doing this? And I ask them, how many times did you read through the Bible this year? And they go, well, I've, I've never read through the Bible. That's where I want you to start. Now, Here's what I want you to see. If you do not pray, let's say you pray zero every day, then I don't want you going out of this building tonight and dedicating yourself to praying an hour tomorrow because that's not going to last. I don't care where you are. I just want to see one foot in front of the other. If you're praying zero right now, set it in your heart. Pray five minutes tomorrow. I don't want you walking out of here and reading 10 chapters a day. Go home. If you've never read through the Bible, start reading in in the book of Matthew and read through the New Testament. A chapter a day, some of you. Some of you may work up to three chapters a day. And here's what I heartily recommend. Now, I study. I'm not exaggerating. Most of my day is given to study. And a lot of times it's the original languages, it's ancient theologians, and all kinds of stuff. Now, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that to make a point. I have daily reading of the Scriptures. And do you know how I do it? Um, I get a cup of coffee. I sit down at a table. And you know what I use? I pull out my my Hebrew and my Greek New Testament. No, I don't. I pull out an English Bible. And not only that, I pull out a study Bible. Why? Because I come to some name of some city and I don't know where it is. I don't want to run to the library. I just want to look down real quick and go on. I use a study Bible. Why? Because I'm not there to write a book on epistemology. I'm there to simply enjoy myself reading through the Bible. That's what I so long for you. Sit down and read a chapter. The John MacArthur Study Bible is good. The ESV Study Bible is good. Centerline Christianity. Basic Christianity. Do you see? And just enjoy yourself. Read a chapter. And then the next day, chapter 2. And just read. Drink coffee, read. Drink tea, whatever you do. And read. And then pray. Now, there's two types of Bible study and there's two types of prayer. And if you don't get this right, you're going to blow it. There's prayer with your boots on and prayer with your boots off. There's reading the Bible with your boots on and reading the Bible with your boots off. I'm talking about boots off here. Now, what do I mean? Most people say it's hard to pray. And that's because they only think of prayer as intercession. If, if you think all that prayer is is intercession, then you're right when you say it's extremely difficult. It's not only extremely difficult, it's warfare. It's horrible. It's sweaty, it's bloody, it's tiring, it hurts, and it's no fun. Most people, listen to me, there's intercession And in intercession, you're grabbing a hold of the horns of the altar. You're crying out to God in Jesus' name to liberate Zambia, to push back evil, to to help our brothers in China. You're working. You're sweating. That's prayer. But that's only intercessory prayer. That's prayer work. That's prayer with your boots on. And if that's all you do, you will never learn to enjoy prayer. That's prayer with your boots on. Prayer with your boots off. It's me at a table with a cup of coffee with my Bible open talking to God. Me, because I live in the forest, walking down a lane talking to God. Me enjoying 
God, me, marveling in sunset, saying, whoa, you painted that one beautiful today. Me, walking with God. Me, laughing with God. Me, talking to God and enjoying God. That's prayer with your boots off. And that's where you need to start. Then there's reading the Bible with your boots on and reading your Bible with your boots off. If all I did was have a Greek text, the Septuagint, and Hebrew, and my text here, and commentaries, and I'm fighting through to figure out what on earth this means, I'm sweating, I'm tired, I want to run away, it's so hard, my brain is wrapped around something, I can't figure it out, and I'm wore out. That's necessary for a preacher. But if that's all his Bible study is, he's going to be in a lot of trouble. So there's reading the Bible with your, with your boots on. When some days, as a lay person, you're going to want to say, I want to understand Romans 6 and 7. Good luck. <laughs> I want to understand Romans 6 and 7. And you may stay there for a couple of weeks, but never let that take away from that time of seated at that table with your boots off, just enjoying God. Please. Please. Also, don't think I pray four hours tomorrow when you usually don't pray. Pray, pray in the morning, pray in the evening, pray at lunch. A few minutes. And begin to cultivate the mind of Christ, begin to cultivate a life of devotion. Okay? I know I've gone on too long, but this is so important for you. Believer, start off small. Just enjoy yourself. When I get to a text and I've got to preach it or I've got to do something, I want to tell you something. It's intimidating. Sometimes I'm even afraid, like I, I make excuses. I don't want to sit down in the chair because I know all the problems I'm going to have to deal with. I get to the text. But in the mornings when I sit down and just read the Bible, it's, a, it's just a little child. I don't have to. I don't have to do anything. But just hear the words of, of my father. Do you see? And if I don't understand it, it, just go on. Learn to walk with God that way, please. All right. Well, we've said a lot of things, haven't we? But if you're here and you don't know Christ, your life has not been transformed and is not transforming. I always say it that way because there is an initial transformation when you're born again. You do become a new creature, and it will be obvious, but then you spend the rest of your life being transformed. And sometimes it's two steps forward and three steps back. So, so, you know, think about these things. Think about these things. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would use this to help your people. And I pray, dear God, that if there's someone here that doesn't have assurance of salvation, that, that, Lord, you would just help in the matter. Help in the matter, Lord. And I pray that Christians will take the things that were said here tonight that, that are true and that you would work at applying them not only to their life but to my life and the pastor's lives who are here. Lord, we all always need to hear this same thing. Help us. In Jesus' name.